Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us from all parts of the globe. Uh, especially my sympathies to those who are joining from South Asia and are somewhere around the midnight mark, including me, um, thanks to Daylight Savings. But that being said, um, today we have with us, you know, lovely Kostov Nayak from um, the University of Pennsylvania, the South Asia Studies Department. And uh, we will, the event that we have today hopefully speaks to you as other events of the South Asia Working Group at Stanford have done so far. Uh, to kick off the session, um, I would like to introduce my co-coordinator um, and co-moderator for this session, uh, Paras Arora, uh, who is a PhD student at the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University, who will be introducing the forum first, and then we'll move ahead with the introductions for the speaker and then the session. Paras, over to you. Thank you so much, Shubhangini, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it is the last event of the quarter for the South Asia Working Group here at Stanford, um, but we are coming up with several other events uh, throughout the academic year. I'll quickly introduce our working group, uh, SOG, as we would like to call it, or SAG uh, for the Punjabis in the audience, uh, is um, a graduate student-led community building effort, which was spearheaded by Shubhangini Gupta and Shantnu Nevrekar in the academic year 2020 to 21, in collaboration with the Stanford Center for South Asia. It's a space for community dialogue and reflection, uh, which is often not easily accessible uh, in the Bay Area. Um, despite it being a space with so many South Asians and South Asianists in it. Uh, and in, in our events, we have always tried to include um, folks from beyond uh, Stanford itself. And we really wish to curate a set of events this year that focus on the practice uh, of creativity, academia, uh, method in, in South Asian studies. And we are so honored to have somebody like Kostub joining us uh, today. Uh, Shubhangani will be now introducing Kostub, and then uh, we look forward to hearing from him and from all of you during the Q&A session. Over to you, Shubhangani. Thank you so much, Paras. So Kostub, uh, as many of you know, is a doctoral student at the South Asia Studies Department at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he traverses many parts, uh, both academically and beyond that. But the, the special part of his professional journey is that he tries to seamlessly incorporate or put these different worlds that he traverses in conversation. Uh, he has an MA degree in performance studies from the School of Culture and Creative Expression from Ambedkar University in Delhi. Uh, his MA dissertation was on Piatra. Uh, my apologies if I'm mispronouncing this. Uh, popular theater group, uh, theater genre amongst uh, lower caste and working class Goan Catholic communities. Um, his, uh, he defended his uh, PhD, sorry, MPhil dissertation in 2019 from in theater and performance studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics in Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. His MPhil thesis was on Marathi plays uh, based on Maratha rulers such as Shivaji and Samaji performed by his village collectives in 20th century Goa. And in this project, he looked at the performances of popular plays revolving around Maratha history and their political significance in Goa. He was awarded the D.D. Kosami Research Fellowship in the Junior Research Fellowship category for the period of 2016-2018 by the Directorate of Art and Culture, Government of Goa, to carry out archival research to study the genealogies of Maratha and Marathi identity among Hindu communities in 20th century Portuguese Goa. He's also a poet uh, and occasionally writes poems in Marathi. Um, and he is a playwright, uh, a lot of which we will hear about today in his presentation, uh, especially um, his maiden play of Avyahat, uh, which is based on the English novel, uh, A Spoke in the Wheel by Amita Kankekar, which, uh, Kanekar, which opened in 2018. He was also awarded the Tandulkar Dubey Fellowship, which is awarded to young theater practitioners in India for the year 2020 by the Vinod and Sarai Doshi Foundation. Um, so uh, there are many more things to uh, maybe say, um, and hopefully Costa will be talking about that in the course of his presentation today. Just briefly on the format, uh, we will have a presentation by Kostov after which we will open to a moderated discussion uh, with him in a question and answer format. As you may have seen when you have joined the session that you may not be able to unmute yourselves or rename yourselves, that is for security reasons, um, but the chat is open. So you can please feel free to put in your questions as 
Kosta is presenting, and even as we are putting forward our questions to you, and we will take them up as much as the time would allow. So with that, without much, uh, without further ado, Kosta, over to you. Thank you. I'll just share the screen and get started. Um... Is this visible now? Um, hi, uh, hi everybody. Uh, and thank you, uh, Paras and Chubangini for uh, putting this up together. I mean, and, uh, and welcome everybody again, because this is uh, like, we know this is the weird time in the semester where semesters are sort of like, closing in and this is a weekday and for people back in India this is like midnight so everybody who has joined thank you for coming uh first of all I would like to uh, also uh, mention my solidarities with with fellow graduate students in US who are protesting for their rights and uh, across in west coast and in east coast and uh, yeah so I'll begin my talk uh, which is around my um, my idea of my practice of my academic work in in sort of creative domain. Um, I just want to say that this I'm doing this for the first time, and it feels a little bit perverse to sort of like talk about your own work like this. And I've never I mean I've never even like looked back and tried to sort of analyze what are the things that have gone through in the last few years. Um, but yeah, if it comes off very pompous, please excuse me. I'm so, uh, yeah. So uh, just to give a context uh, for my theater work, I was born in, in a family of theater makers. Um, so um, so I work for a company called the House Sangeet Natimandar, which was founded by my grandfather Vishwanath Naik in the year 1950, um, when Goa was still under the Portuguese rule. Uh, my grandfather was 15 year old then, and he started this company as was uh, as was a culture of like theater performances in Goa back then. Uh, what we have in Goa is that theater performances are patronized by local temples during temple festivals, and you know there is separate budget sort of uh, provisioned for that. And um, at some point, um, you know a lot of semi-professional theater companies started uh, coming up, and my grandfather founded one such company. He was probably one of the most popular theater companies of that time. Had like some of the biggest names in in Goan stage associated with the company. Um, then and it has seen a lot of change since then. I mean, uh, we'll complete 73 years of our existence since our foundation uh, in April 23. Uh, and so you can imagine that kind of history and what has, what it has encompassed is is almost a three generations of artists and not just actors but writers, musicians, designers, uh, you know, all, all kinds of trades that are required to. Uh, mount a production like a theater production um, we have sort of like worked with almost three generations of artists um, and I belong to let's say what, what is called third generation um, so I, I grew up in this family I, I mean even though it's a it my my entire family was involved in this there, there are members outside the family as well um, and at any given point, it's at least, it's an ensemble of 30, 35 people uh, who come together to produce a, a production almost every year. So we have not done in past couple of years due to COVID, but, uh, but as has been a tradition, we do a new production every year. Um, so I grew up in this family and that's how, that's how literature, music um, and uh, theater, art was always around. Um, and even though I went in a very, initially I went on a very traditional route, like a good DC boy, I, I did my bachelor's and master's in computer science. And at some point decided to quit that and, and come back, like go to, like shift to humanities. Uh, I don't know if it's a good decision or not at this point, but, but yeah, so that's the shift I made. So this is, I mean, this is the context of my theater work. I mean, it's all, it's rooted in, in my work for the company. Um, and it's only last few years that I, I focused on playwriting, though I've done a lot of other work around theater, in, including acting, direction, design, teaching also kids. But I, I always wanted to be a writer, uh, a playwright. Um, 
though I never had the courage to write one, even though, you know, in a sense that this kind of infrastructure was available to me. And it's only by an accident and in the sense that um, it's only when my father passed away that there was a void. Like my father was also a playwright and that's after his, his death, there was a like there was this void that one, somebody had to like take up that responsibility. So I stepped in and the first play that I wrote was actually a translation of a Hindi play called Kaumudi, which is by Abhishek Majumdar. I mean, you should check out his work. He's perhaps the... the top playwrights of India, who's also known globally and has commissions in UK and US at this point. Um, and so next, after, I mean, just after cutting my teeth with translation, I adapted um, Amita Karnekar's novel, A Spoke in the Wheel, um, into a Marathi play that was called Avyahat. It opened in 2018 uh, and went on to perform uh, shows um, till 2020. I mean, I think the last show we performed was in January 2020. Um, and then we were hoping for a longer Maharashtra tour um, in, in March. Uh, in, and, and that's when the COVID hit. So the play was shut uh, since then. Um, just to give a context for the play, the um, the the play or the novel is set in in the in the aftermath of Kalinga War, uh, set in the ancient historical period. Uh, it's like after Kalinga War, uh, Emperor Ashok has sort of you know emerged as this de facto ruler of the Magadha Empire, and uh, it it deals with those events. So they, basically, there are like two narratives. One is where a monk called Upali is is commissioned to write a biography of Buddha. Um, by Ashoka and that is that will become the official version of of B Buddha's biography that the emperor will then sort of disseminate across across his people and this is I mean Upali is sort of like a PhD student I mean he's commissioned to write this and then he's also expected to read his chapters to to the committee and the com in the sense there is this whole Buddhist monastic order called the Sangh uh, to which he has to come and present this chapter and um, the play unfolds over him reading three chapters um, uh, of his writing. And after every 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 chapter that he reads, there is there's a growing conflict between um, the seniors within the Buddhist monastic order and what Upali is writing, because what Upali is writing is a very um, very what do you say very objective scientific uh, reinterpretation of Buddhism and Buddha. Whereas the Sangh wants a very godly, uh, larger than life image of Buddha to be projected. And Upali ju just doesn't relent because of like his, I mean, he just wants to stick with his interpretation of Buddhism and Buddha. And the second narrative in the play um, was about, uh, was around this character called uh, Bhima. So Bhima is, is, a, is a chief of a clan called Buryas who were the prisoners of the Kalinga war, who have been brought into the Magadha empire and uh, they were forest dwellers, but now they are forced into agricultural labor and they, they reside near the monastery, which Upali is also uh, stay, stays, uh, is residing. So Upali and Bhima develop this friendship and through their sort of conversations, uh, one, ha one gets a sense of what it means to be religious, what is the idea of development, what is, what is the idea of state, and eventually it is sort of revealed that um, Upali, uh, Bhima is, I mean, Bhima and his clan, because they want to also flee away from this, this forced labor uh, that they are put in, decide to take up arms against the state. And it, that's where, again, uh, Upali sort of tries to convince Bhima about the Buddhist way of like dealing with things. And that's where another conflict, set of conflict uh, arises. Uh, if anybody wants to watch the play, you can just like send me an email or a message and I can share it because this play is subtitled. The only thing I can't share it publicly because um, it's it's copyrighted with the publisher. Um, uh, so uh, the play is in Marathi, but it has English subtitles. And some of the themes that um, that came about in the as in the process of sort of uh, staging this play was the idea of religion, um, the violence of the state, indigenous rights, caste, and modes of writing history. I mean, there are other things as well, but these were some of the key themes that I could identify. That um, and and the sort of the success of the play was that it it spoke to the predicament of our current times. 
And I think the constant response that we got was that, you know, even people are saying that even though this is set in like ancient period, uh, one could see the similarities of 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 the uh, similarities between that period and this period, though it's a fictional sort of account. Uh, so it's a fictional history kind of novel. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is something um, that Avyat was managed to uh, Avyat has managed to do, uh, and it performed in uh, Goa as well in Maharashtra and in Kerala. Uh, and I think to Amita's credit also, uh, I think you guys should pick the novel. Uh, it's it's a it's it's a slightly slightly large novel, uh, around six hundred pages, and the way it is structured is the odd chapters are around Upali's life and events around him, and the even chapters are uh, are the biography of Buddha that he writes, and 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 the biography that sort of uh, Amita weaved into uh, weaved into this was was the. Sort of Ambedkarite reinterpretation of Buddhism, the Navayana, um, Navayana school of thought. Uh, so that gave a lot of material for us to sort of like build arguments around uh, around that interpretation, as opposed to a certain conventional idea of Buddhism, so to speak. Um, the second play that I wrote was called Bhaval. Uh, it was uh, written over the lockdown period um, and was staged in December 2020 for the slight window that had opened up before the second wave hit so we could perform only three uh three shows of the play before it shut down and i mean again it has not been performed again um so this is based on the bawalpur sanyasi case i mean those from bengal would know this but uh, if you have read partho chatterjee's book a princely imposter uh, it talked the book is about that and then there was a there was a reprint of that uh, book by Penguin, where they sort of stripped the book of all the footnotes and all the academic jargon and just made it into almost like a nonfiction novel kind of a thing. So, uh, uh, and there are films up, up around this case, uh, the recent one being one by Srijit Mukherjee, which is not a not a great film, but uh, uh, but yeah, this this story, as my friends from Bengal have told me, has has you know fascinated generations um, uh, uh, across. Um, and what what it presented was like a huge corpus of archival material, um, and it the case was very in the case uh, the case was very unique. Um, I mean, just to give a sense of what happens in the play uh, or in the case, is that there's this Bhavalpur Zamindari, which is in presently in Bangladesh, and um, um, the 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 second prince or the second kumar of of the zamindari um uh is is ramendra roy who is known for his vices in the sense he drinks has you know he has sort of illicit relationship with women and stuff and he he contracts um uh, syphilis and then uh, is bedridden and then is asked to uh, move out of bhawalpur for change of weather so he goes to darjeeling where he he dies mystery i mean he dies of of his illness and uh, so when his funeral is happening, uh, people take him to the uh, Smashan Bhumi and uh, when he's put on the pyre, um, they, it starts raining very heavily. So people depart and when they come back, they don't find his dead body. And then they return thinking that, okay, something happened. And 12 years later, uh, uh, an, a Naga Sadhu ascetic uh, sort of walks into Bhavalpur and parks himself outside, uh, outside the village near, near the lake. And people start noticing that he looks very similar to to the to the Bawal Kumar who died twelve years ago, and that that becomes like a sort of like Chinese whisper thing, and it suddenly sort of brings in a lot of people who just people just come to see him, flock flock to see him, and try to match, try to think, oh, is he the Bawal Kumar or not? And this news reaches the family, and the family gets involved, and. And so what used to happen in, in British India is that there was this institution called Court of Wards, uh, which was responsible uh, to manage um, uh, Zamindari estates in the case of the estate not having a male descendant. So with death of Bhaval Kumar, uh, Ramindra Roy, um, there is no male descendant in the family. So the, the ownership or the... the uh, the the ownership of the zamindari goes to court of wards which is a colonial institution and in, in exchange of that they they 
pay a nominal stipend to the family to to for the upkeep of the house and other other subsistence um, resources and uh, so for the now the family is also in uh, family is also interested in proving that he's bawal he's the bawal kumar that has returned so that they can get the zamindari back and so on the context of this there is like a lot of people who sort of uh, you know testify uh, in uh, for or against him of uh, him being bawal kumar uh, and one person who who refuses to tes testify that he's bawal kumar is actually his wife bibhavati uh, she refuses to acknowledge him she refuses to sort of say uh, she just says that he, he's not the man that i married um and uh, she's she's been convinced by a lot of family members but she doesn't relent and so does the case progresses so at the actual case went on for almost like 14 to 16 years uh past two three courts was eventually settled in london's privy council um though we did not sort of in the play because it's a two hour play you can't necessarily um you can't necessarily uh, you know encompass that period in like a two hour structure so what we did was we staged it around the first case but to to sort of um, to anchor it in a certain um, certain context what we focused on the, the media frenzy around it and this interestingly this play was written in in the backdrop of uh, sushant singh rajput's death uh and and the tragic sort of uh i mean the tragic death but the what that which was eclipsed by the kind of media frenzy that in, was, was inaugurated by indian media around his death uh so we sort of decided to place it in that context and make this make this play about like a critique of of a certain um certain practices within media where where they you know they are so desperate to drive public opinion uh, whether it's true or false it, it doesn't matter but it's everybody has their own agenda to run with and even in the archival material that partho chatterjee sort of puts up in the book you realize that there's so much of print material that is produced around this this case there are so many performances even uh, during that time um, uh, that are being staged uh, the so much of cultural production that happens around this case and some of it was in the book so we use that to sort of create scenes and uh, situations uh, that could speak to you know a sort uh, a slightly more contemporary concern of the role of media in our society um and uh, yeah i mean so uh, this is also a photo from from bawal um so i i just want to probably speak about like the process of a method of writing these things and what drives me um to to work on some of these uh themes one is the idea of argument or argumentation and uh argument not in the sense that the play has to you know make an argument but for me it is also important that characters argument with each other because i think again one of the fallout of our, 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 our prime time debates for example we there we we've just lost the ethics and civility of debate in our society and uh, the 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 sheer sheer what do you say the sheer quality of debating the even you know even even in like even daily debates that we have with people are so become so violent and loud um so i mean i i through these characters i want to sort of restore a certain sense of what what a what a civil or ethical debate looks like so all these characters in the play both in avyar and in uh, bhawal there there's a constant argumentation that keeps happening um uh so that's one the second thing was to bring some of the ideas that you take from uh, you know your academic training or your participation in like social movements and sort of bring them to a more design level not to say not to make it more textual or verbal but how can you infuse them in 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 um at the level of design for example or the level of creating characters uh for example one of the one of the things that i i have been sort of very uh, peculiar about is to have um dalit bahujan adivasi characters who are in like in protagonist uh, positions who have a certain power and uh, who are very articulate and assert assertive about their politics about their positionality uh because uh, i'm sure in in other forms of literature as well but in theater there is a serious dearth of like uh, characters from these communities uh, and and you know who come with a certain assertiveness 
And I think as somebody who has been involved in do certain anti caste discourse, it it is also almost an imperative for me to write those kind of characters. Uh, so in in uh, Avyat, for example, Upali was Upali is a, a let's say is a is a is a character from a marginalized caste background. And that's how his solidarity with Bhima, who's also an Adivasi character in a sense, um, is sort is 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 built that that uh, the chemistry between Bhima and Upali is built on that ground of some sort of shared solidarity of of discrimination and oppression. Though in the play, it never it 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 comes as as a passing mention about his caste and his his power or his his presence in the play is not determined by his caste location but rather it's it's reverse um and yeah i mean there was and the second case interesting thing that um i i uh, we tried to do in bhawal for example was the character of vibhavati the wife of uh, bhawal kumar uh and because there was hardly any material that that spoke about her her as a person let's say uh, what the, the sense that we got was that she was slightly timid playing this, uh, you know, uh, playing this uh, elite daughter-in-law um, in the family. Um, so what we did was to make make her into like a very strong assertive character to a point that almost the male characters around her seem very weak in front of her. So, I mean, I think I'm running short of time. So... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we can discuss more about the plays. Uh, and there's this one last thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, both Swangin and Paris wanted me to talk about is also I, there's one thing I also do apart from writing plays is to write in the popular press. Um, I have been doing it since 2015. I used to write an English column um, for a newspaper called The Goan. Um, uh, I used to write like a fortnightly column on Goan culture and politics which ran for almost a couple of years. Uh, then I had to stop because of th my thesis writing. Uh, and then recently I started writing a Marathi column um, for, for another popular paper in Goa called the Gomantak, uh, where I, I was writing, uh, um, so I was writing sort of summarized essays about academic scholarship that has happened on Goa. For, because I realized that, um, you know, often academic scholarship is read among very limited circles and uh, often people on whom it is written about are unaware of it and if if we can sort of you know make those texts accessible to a more wider audience there could be slightly more interest generated around reading it and one of the responses i got was from younger students who are now in their ba's and ma's who, um, you know, I mean, there, there's also the question of what syllabuses the state universities have, which are not as updated as, you know, what one might study in Delhi or other, you know, urban places. So when they were reading these texts and, you know, it helped sort of them in their research. So that was like one positive feedback that I, I got. I had to stop writing the column for some reason, but I'm hoping to uh, resume it probably by next year. So, yeah, uh, are, we, are we on time? So that's that's up from me. And if we have any questions and uh, comments, uh, we can take those. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. And I mean, there, there is a lot of uh, questions and hopefully the latter half of this can tease out some of the things and the richness and the granularity of the projects that you've taken up. And to kind of start with your theater work here, I think one of the things um, I was curious about was um, that your early theater writing work in, in particular, uh, Bhaval, um, centered around building on the content that had already gathered momentum. Um, and that was something that was cross-engaging academia as well as like public imagination. So do you feel that engaging with content like this, that not only draw on historical and contemporary truths, but render them in formats and templates um, engaging to the public at large as the audience um, is the way to go to convene between academic and non-academic works successfully? Uh, I mean, that's not the only way to go, let's say. Uh, I mean, let's say historical fiction has been doing that work for a very long time. Uh, and these are not different mediums. Uh, I think what theater lends itself 
is is that it's it the, by the very nature of it it's a it's a live medium so um that's the only thing um and there is there is also the possibility of constant renewal i mean we can add or or keep improving on things but uh, for me it is important to convey the argument of let's say whatever the archive that i'm or the material that i'm looking uh, from uh so i think that would be something that that sort of entices me um uh, and maybe not all not all uh, kinds of historical material might lend to that kind of uh, uh, that kind of rendition um, for example um, but uh, often, but i often feel like some when i was read, i was doing a course on subaltern studies last year and well some you read, when you read some of those essays i mean like oh, this has to be a tv show i mean there is nothing else that you can make out of it you know so while i, I just have these weird kings of like well reading some of this material like okay this can be a play uh, i was reading an anthropology anthro anthropology book last year on on the on the soya bean farming in in latin america and, and only that looked like you know very very um, very potent sort of plot for a play uh and i hope i mean i hope to sort of borrow more from academic uh material because i think it 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 sort of eases the amount of research that you need to put in if you're writing it from scratch like uh, you know and i think people are um, people are open to sort of those kind of reinterpretation of their work so yeah i mean i don't know if that answers your question but uh, it does and i think it's also i mean interesting in this sense because what i was thinking as as you were also talking was i mean there's a difference as as um graduate students or students um or researchers that deal with a lot of textual data uh, there is uh, there are a lot of narratives that we come across right and especially for students who work on history the one of the challenges is to weave together a story that's coherent for one specific audience um and to then build on but from what you just said um there's also certain sensibility that engages that is cross engaging across both you know like instead of thinking of um okay what would work for theater but to be but rather to also be fully immersed in academic space and then it automatically it's more of an instinctual thing that what um, make for good stories and what would um translate across the different audiences but i guess like that also speaks to the fact that precisely because you engage with different mediums a lot of the times you do have that sense that what would appeal to you as well as your readers and your audience yeah in bhawal for example uh, you know it, it, the first draft of it was written just as as dramatizing um, court testimonies and then we tried to sort of put that in some sort of linear fashion and then when it went on the floor you know the director and other people who were involved and that's the fun of like doing theater because it's also a very collaborative process uh is is that uh, then we changed it so much and uh and it and it was still becoming like a story from it started from x and goes to z but then we created the, the director ketan he came up with this idea of creating these two characters which are like you know uh, uh these two witnesses that come out of of um, come out of their roles and you know it it gave a slightly absurdist turn to the play where they would just like intervene into the court proceedings they would just go and sit on the lap of the judge and stuff like that so i mean and they became and it, it, they became the in a sense narr they not narrators but they it is through their perspective the the play sort of started unfolding so even though in a sense that we couldn't i mean it, and they were from like let's say peasant peasant backgrounds and you know even their interest in proving whether he is bhawal kumar or not and they keep and so some of those questions from that position also uh, were uh, we were able to sort of include those uh, those positions because we could create those characters you know what i mean so um, theater i mean in sense theater would give you that that um, flexibility of like breaking out of realism breaking a uh, jumping time times maybe with like with a certain popular notion of film making let's say it not it might not happen uh, but like in yeah, the i mean something very specific to theater would be that too, you know that you can come in in and out of like the time period that you are uh, you are supposed to represent yeah thank you for that 
I would also encourage our audience to feel free to put in your questions in the chat, if uh, anonymously or for everyone. While we are curating a set of questions, I had a question for Kostov about uh, your training in history um, and in graduate your, your graduate life in particular and how, I mean, we are barely able to do a coursework on time. So this is like really <laughs> commendable. I was wondering what kind of labor and what kind of strategies does kind of speaking to different audiences require, right? I can totally think of, History is a discipline where there are traditions of this kind of critical fiction writing, Sadia Hartman's work, you know, to kind of attend to the limits of the archive with kind of invention and with um, um, writing in prose and in narrative. But those are not traditions which are really encouraged in graduate school, right? So I was just wondering, how does this work dovetail with your graduate training and experience as a graduate student? If you could tell us a little bit about that. I mean, given that I'm in a coursework semester right now, it's it's nearly impossible to write while doing this. So you need to like find time between um, you know summer breaks um, to to do that. And sometimes these things, I mean, because your your attention is split between like ten different things, it often takes a slightly longer time. I mean, people who just do playwriting are able to do it much more efficiently, I guess. Uh, but I. I I'm I'm very uh, fragmented and haphazard about that. I mean, there's there's no uh, good answer I can. I mean, there's no answer that I can give you that will make me look good here. So <laughs> the labor is. I mean, in the sense, the only thing is that because you while training, you are reading a lot of stuff, right? In your coursework, even even it not be directly related to what you're writing. Uh, let's say I was reading Barry Flood's book uh, um, uh, for a presentation tomorrow in class. And I realized oh, this can be a very good resource, not just because the kind of archival material that it puts, but also kind of framework of analysis that it gives you that, you know, that the societies are constantly in flux. Uh, you know, there is interaction between, let's say, um, Northwest frontier and, and the Central Asia, uh, Asiatic region. So even let's say that kind of, you know, if you read that book, so next time if I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm designing costume for some play, you know, that just sort of feeds into that. So you don't have to necessarily, um, uh, what do you say, necessarily, for, I mean, um, necessarily uh, only read specific about the kind of uh, kind of material that you're writing for. Any any material can sort of feed into uh, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes in, in what you're writing. Um, like some of the arguments, like I, I remember like one particular argument about the indigenous uh, rights uh, in Avyar actually came from a no another novel that a friend wrote in Marathi, which is very avant-garde, sort of more modernist novel uh, um, called Pan Pani and Prava. Uh, but that sort of really fit into what I was writing for Avyar because it also, the, the novels like, is also centered on um you know uh, next light uh, areas in in maharashtra uh, for example so these i mean i think the key is only to read widely um and and um, and keep making notes which is also what you do in academia or actually you're supposed to do in academia so uh, yeah well 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 <laughs> um we have questions from the audience uh, from shaista she says, um, thanks so much for this talk and your work, Kostov. Was thinking of some plays by Adivasi creators and thinking about how their plays have deepened conversations about caste and indigeneities in ways that are not possible through academic work. Are there any particular kind of conversations that were generated exceeding the parameters of what you are you all were working with? Thanks. Um so I mean, Oh, I, I, uh... yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, what it probably created was, let's say, uh, it gives people a certain framework of analysis um, that even though, let's say, the play is specifically uh, rooted in ancient time, but how do we now see the questions of indigenous people uh, and their rights? Um, and this is what, like, this is only, I'm just saying this from, like, post-performance discussions, uh, you know, because uh, people who came up to you and talked about it or people who wrote about it. And uh, 
and much of it was to the success of not just the the, the script but also the actors who sort of performed it because you know if one show where like if the character was playing bima if he's not he doesn't lend the character that well in one particular show probably that thing gets also eclipsed but people did come up and say that uh, you know that uh, it did um, and this is this is this is an urban audience uh, you i mean you can't also make assumptions about their their political um, sensitivity but again uh, it it touched on 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 a sort of like a in, like a wide range of people with different political affiliation so i think it, it if not i mean i don't know what, to what extent one can measure and expect this but um, i guess it if even if it sparks a conversation or even if it makes them feel um, to read more or to sort of like know more i think a play has i mean in that sense the play could be successful to at least to start that conversation and then the success of the play is probably would be something that begins after the show is over so if it makes you think a lot of people wrote to me 2 3 days after uh, after the show that you know they were like oh, i'm still thinking about some of these issues um and and what what would you suggest you know is there anything more that we can read about uh, in you know what is happening in uh, in in our current period for example so yeah i mean some of these discussions happened personally but i don't know if i can give you like a very broad answer about this thank you um shanto also had a question about writing as a phd student so he does understand the pain thank you so much i have a question about uh, your experience working with the natya mandal um you know art is refined and practiced and improvised within the family tradition in south asia and i was wondering if having worked with natya mandal for so long and now kind of being the third generation of artists has the conception of family and tradition itself come to change for you especially when you think of it along lines of anti caste uh, politics um through your long term engagement with uh, theater writing through that because i mean that's a kind of a selfish question because i work on family but um i would love to hear about you know how your experience working with family where family's conception itself is so open to people outside biological kinship as it were how is that kind of change and if you would like to talk a little bit about it yeah that see that that definitely has happened because one thing is that you i grew up around so many people uh you know uh and to a point that uh i was almost raised by the members of theater company because they would be there rehearsing for at least 3 4 months during the season i mean 3 2 months rehearsing 2 months performing um so uh often i feel more closely associated with them than let's say my uh, you know this like cousins and uh, because i've grown up around them uh so that has i mean the the conception of family is sort of um, is broad in that sense a tradition it, it's it's a fight i would say because uh, you know uh, like our summer summer holidays are just spent in like doing theater workshops and uh, there's uh, there's only really very little that one anything else could do the, the anything else we could do uh during the summer uh, apart from doing this th- this and after a point it stopped bothering in a sense ki uh, you know initially i was like kyun karna hai sab but uh, after that it just became part of it to a point that it, like i never thought theater as an extra curricular activity this is something you did like you know if and there was no escaping out of it even my training in music for example i learned uh, hindustani classical music i was sent to learn cl- music because they thought okay if he learns music he'll probably be an accompanist during the play so you no know, that's like one and so this is this is how me and my cousin were sort of pushed into learning music um uh so yeah i mean the tradition does weigh on you often often and in in times where you need you want to break away from it even in and not just of tradition of doing theater also the kind of theater you want to do like right now we are in a transition phase where there is like considerable senior uh, people who have been with the company for 30 years and then there is like a flux of younger member from our our generation 
and often what we understand um, as theater who, who's who, i mean some of, because some of our, our uh, some of our people uh, who are contemporary to me they have learned they went out of goa they have studied theater so their exposure to theater is different i have traveled around and i've seen theater so my exposure to a certain kind of theater is different from what they have seen traditionally so often making those inroads you know making formal changes making a uh, breaking away from a certain realistic style of making theater those things are still still uh, still a challenge and that you have to work out and then family is also it's a, it's a, it's a very diabolical thing right i mean it can be can be supporting but it can also be very uh, imposing in a sense so those are those challenges remain um and and uh, you know that's a constant negotiation so there is no one understanding um of of what it means to uh, be in a extended family of of artist and also at the same time you know keeping up with the tradition there are certain tradition one has kept up with uh like for example i remember every year of the play would open my grandfather would go and like put a coconut in front of a very local deity uh, of our community and though i necessarily don't believe uh, i'm not a believer in a sense in a trad- conventional sense but i still do that because for me it's it's an invocation of my grandfather's memory not necessarily the 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 faith of it right and i i, I remember one of my friend was visiting um, and she's like you whenever you talk against bjp i'm going to like put this photo and say yes they do yes bhagwan ko matlab is he's praying and stuff but uh, <laughs> but yeah though i mean some of those traditions one one has kept like i i just i just accept that i need to do it because it is also a, 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 i mean yeah tradition also sort of re- make you remember people uh, who are not around um so in that sense yeah thank you for that um i think i was hoping if you could now speak a little bit more on um just a, a pedagogical um role of not of but rather like how you are traversing these different worlds right and a large part of it of course what you've grown up with um and things and also parts you've picked up along the way so um how i if you could like speak a little bit more because something we also try and do in the forum is like people who are looking towards if not similar career trajectories but are grappling with questions either on writings and limitations one aspect is the limitations of bringing you know trying to manage these different um, avenues together but for people who do want to successfully take these up no irrespective of if this exactly the way you do it what would you say is the way to do that would you rec- some number one would you recommend it or not second is if you do uh, then how is it realistically that one needs to assess the priorities of these different avenues and go about them yeah I, i'm not sure if i would rec- i mean uh, i don't know if i could recommend it but i think i do it out of a certain volition and a, some sense of ethics of uh, you know that i need to sort of pass disseminate this knowledge that one because i mean somebody i mean you are in a public university and you know there is like the state is spending money on you and like what is your role in sort of you know these are like very broad ideas that you know one can say that are very pretentious and stuff but uh, I, you know i mean for like some of some of the subordinate studies historians for example they would write in the, the durga puja magazines they they, they would write, and they would write uh, long essays in bengali about in and not just history but also the method of writing history and a lot of academics do that like uh, i know for like for prachi deshpande for example she constantly writes in marathi um, about some of these things um and i i draw inspiration from uh, those kind of people who have uh, who sort of do this as some part of responsibility of of giving it i don't know to call it giving back or maybe like when i was doing the marathi column it was my own selfish interest to you know compile the notes and sort of then I say okay if i'm compiling my results just translate them and put it out in in a newspaper and people might read, read it so i think that's a choice that one has to make that do you do you feel risk i mean 
do you feel that responsibility to sort of uh, make that contribution and it's not possible always i mean um, uh, given the, the given the rigor of our coursework and our phd and the expectations of our degrees uh, it's not possible to do churn it like uh, regularly and some people do it but uh, you know we also have to write term papers and uh, our, our own thesis as well uh, which are very different genres of writing altogether um, because that's also a challenge because you keep shifting between these because do if so when you're writing a book review let's say do you finish in like 700 words because that's the limit of a print newspaper or do you go for like, then can you summarize it in a more broader way? Also the other challenges of language. I mean, it's easier to write it, write it in English because you know we read in English, we think in English. Some of these categories and concepts are available in English, but how do you then translate it into Marathi? Um, like I, I was writing about this uh, book called Refiguring Goa, which is like an anth anthropological sort of interpret, uh, like Marxist reinterpretation of Goan political economy after Goa's liberation. And I just wrote, and so oh, this is like a Marxist reinterpretation. But then I realized I need to also write what, what, what Marxist interpretation is. So how do you then translate a dialectical a idea of a dialectical materialism? Uh, do you do you water it down or do you create like a very opaque term that just says, you know, like just like translate in a very heavy Marathi register. So these are the choices that one needs to make a while while doing it. So uh, and I think if I mean, it's only by doing it all the more is you become more uh, fluent in it. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's the yeah. that's this is what I've realized while doing it. I mean, this is nothing um, nothing great, but uh, the more you do it, more easier it becomes. I like I was when I was writing the column initially, uh, it took me a while to produce an article. Uh, but as as I was as I was um, as I became it, as I became more regular, uh, I could. It was then it wasn't that difficult to come up with nine hundred words every second week, or some event and some interpretation of it. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Costa. Um, I think we can end there if there aren't any questions from the audience. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for our second event of the autumn quarter. We will come back to you with several events in the winter quarter starting mid-January. Um, I also want to thank the Stanford Center for South Asia, Lalita Duperon, and uh, Simrat Kaur Mataru in particular for their consistent uh, support to the both of us as we are trying to co-coordinate this group across India and the United States. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it was it was lovely. And thank you so much to Kostov for opening up about his practice, his history, and also his aspirations for the future with us. It was really um, the best we could hope for for this autumn quarter. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for having me.